Hello, my name is Linda Komaroff. I'm the Curator of Islamic Art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where we are today. It's a little bit noisy because members of the public are walking through, so you'll have to uh, excuse that, but welcome. Looking at this object from our collection, which is a tinned copper bowl. It looks quite red because most of the tin surfacing has worn away. The tin was applied to give it a feeling of silver and so it was part of its original decoration. So this bowl dates to the end of the 15th or the beginning of the 16th century. It was produced during the time of the Timurid dynasty. The Timurids ruled from 1370 to 1506. They were the last great Central Asiatic dynasty that conquered the Iranian world. So their empire include, included all of modern Iran, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and some other Istans. This bowl has special importance to me. It's the first object that I acquired as a curator at LACMA in 1996, a long time ago. But I've known of this object even longer than that. In fact, it was something I had included in my dissertation. My dissertation encompassed metal work that was produced under the Timur dynasty. It included luxury brasswares inlaid with silver and gold, as well as tinned copper objects of this type. I didn't know that much about the bowl at the time that I wrote my dissertation. I was only aware of it from one black and white photograph published in a 1959 book in which the inscriptions on it have, had been misread as a signature. And then I came across the inscriptions again uh, in a uh, Russian periodical called Epigraphica Vostoka, which is basically just oriental inscriptions where the Persian verses on it had been read by a Soviet scholar named Leon Guzalian. And he was able to show that it in fact doesn't have a signature, but in fact has these very important Persian verses. At the time I was writing my dissertation, I didn't understand the importance of the inscriptions. I knew what they said, but not how important they might be. One of the reasons I did not understand how important they were, because the state of the field had not advanced to the extent that it has today, and a lot of important discoveries had been made about the use of drawings, drawings on paper, as an intermediary for the artist um, from, from practice to finished object. The drawings were known to have been used for those who worked on the arts of the book. But at the time I wrote my dissertation, there was very little known about how drawings might have been used for three-dimensional objects. And as we're going to see, this is key to understanding the importance of the object's inscriptions. So I'm not going to keep you in suspense about these Persian inscriptions. It's a poem. It's divided into eight different cartouches. And for those who are well-versed in Persian, Persian poetry, it is not great poetry. In fact, there's a little bit missing from um, one half of one of the couplets, but it's, it's four couplets. So I'm going to read it in English first, and then I'm going to read the key verse uh, in Persian. So here we go. My ear discerned a voice reverberating from the bowl. I drew and made a thousand designs for the sake of the bowl. Seeking what is hidden on our lips, we want to say 100 words into the bottom of the bowl. How long will he find his useless presence in the palm of the silver-breasted beauties? Alas, such is the cruelty of the bowl. Fill the bowl with clear wine, O sage, and then experience the bowl with your searching gaze. The poem, as you could see, is self-referential. It speaks about the bowl, and part of it seems to speak in the voice of the artist. And it seems likely, therefore, because it's not great poetry and because it does speak about the bowl, that the poem was written specifically for this object or objects of this specific type. But what's even more interesting about the poem is that it gives us a window into how the object itself was made. I'm going to repeat the second half of the first couplet, which is in the voice of the artist, and it says, I drew and made a thousand designs for the sake of the bowl. And in Persian, Bastam Hazar Naksha Amal Azbaraya Tos. So why is that important? Well, 
I drew and made a thousand designs for the sake of the bowl. That seems to be the voice of the artist. And if we look at the designs on the bowl, we can see the floral decoration and how carefully done it is. But what else does that mean to us? Well, as I mentioned or alluded to a little bit earlier, we have come over the last, let's say, 20 plus years to understand how drawings on paper were used in a variety of media, not just in manuscript illustration or in book binding, but in textiles and in three-dimensional objects. So what I think we have happening here is the artist actually speaking about the process of making the bowl. And in fact, from the earlier part of the 15th century, drawings have survived in two different albums, one in Berlin and one in Istanbul. And in fact, the one in Berlin includes elements from the Istanbul album, but these drawings incorporate the same types of designs that we see on the bowl, the same types of floral images and the same types of abstract images. And if we can even go beyond that, it turns out that there's another bowl that's just like this one that uh, came up for sale a couple of years ago, and it includes the same verses on it with the very last couplet omitted, but it's done in the very same style. The style of writing is the same. And so it suggests to us that not only did the artist use those thousand and one designs or those thousand designs for the sake of the bowl just for this one, but he used it on another bowl. And in fact, he may have used it on a whole series of tinned copper bowls because there's a whole group that all seem to have come from the same workshop that are just like this bowl. The poetic inscription has so much information. Uh, it's not merely that it's self-referential and tells us the name of the object, which is toss. It also tells us that this is a bowl for wine. Now you can see from the large size of it that it's not the kind of bowl that you would hold up to your lips to drink from, even if you are a much bigger person than, than I am. What seems likely is that it's a bowl that was used for transferring the wine to something smaller. And in fact, there's a 14th century Persian text written in Baghdad, so at the absolute western end of the Iranian world from where this was made and over a century earlier, but it may still help us to understand. In this text, it talks about a toss or bowl, which is for wine, and then it specifically says that in order to make the wine more portable, since this is not an easily lifted bowl, that the, that the wine is transferred through a ladle into a smaller cup. And so it's possible that that's exactly how this bowl would have been used. And in fact, we have in our collection a small tin copper cup that preserves most of its tinning that's done in the same workshop as this, but much smaller in size, that may have been made as part of a set, not necessarily with this one, but with another, kind of like a modern day punch bowl set, but in this case, it's for wine. This was clearly a work of art that was not just utilitarian, but was precious to those who owned it. So right over here beneath the rim, we have a later owner's mark. So someone wanted to make sure that if he ever lent it out, it would come back to him. So here's that key part of the inscription for me, which talks about I, how I drew and made a thousand designs for the sake of the bowl. Now this is probably one of the hardest inscriptions I've ever had to deal with. And if uh, the Soviet scholar Leon Guzalian had not read it first, translated into Russian, um, it would have been almost impossible to read because one of the, it sounds facetious, but one of the main ways to be able to read an inscription with ease is to know in advance what it says. And because I now know what it says, when I saw the second bowl with the same inscription that came up for sale, I was immediately able to read it. But it, it helps to know. So just to give you an idea of how hard this is, as is typical of Timurid inscriptions, not just in metalwork, but even in architecture. It goes not just from right to left, but it sometimes goes from top to bottom, where the inscription is divided into two registers. This one is even more convoluted. So the very first word of the line is actually down here, and so you have bastam, 
and then you have Hazar, and then you have Naqsh, and then you go back up to here for Amal, and then it just keeps going across. And this is true of all the text on this object. And it's probably written this way because it makes more sense as a design and it holds together, together better. We're not dealing with something that's simply written on a piece of paper that someone could stare at or a page in a book. This is a three-dimensional object. So it would have been moved or held in someone's hand. So it would make it much easier to move it back and forth or up and down and to read the inscription that way. And the fact that it's so hard to read does not mean that the, that the artist wanted it to be hard to read. I think the artist was really thinking about it design-wise because the artist was, in fact, concerned with legibility. He included a number of orthographic sy symbols to make it easier to, to distinguish one letter from another. Again, suggesting that it's not meant to be confusing, it's simply meant to be beautiful. I've lifted the bowl up and you can see that the decoration goes almost to the bottom of the bowl. Hopefully you can also see it's mostly floral and leaf decoration. You see interesting kinds of lotuses, lotus flowers embraced by um, split leaves. And it's a very rigid kind of symmetrical decoration. The original inspiration almost certainly comes from possibly Chinese porcelain but it's been filtered through several other different sources. And so it's, it's been converted into something that's more pleasing to a Timurid um, uh, audience. As you can see, the decoration is compartmentalized. So the inscription, as I've mentioned, is in these eight cartouches. On either side of the, are these quatrefoil compartments that have what would be like a interlocking Y pattern then these very fine designs in the interstices, which again is almost certainly from Chinese uh, blue and white porcelain. Then you can see these narrower bands of, of, of leaves. And then, as I mentioned at the bottom, you have these very beautiful, boldly drawn, but very symmetrical lotus blossoms that are enclosed by leaves. And when we look at some of the drawings that have survived from the 15th century, they're very, very similar in feel to this type of, of decoration. And one of these things these drawings help to confirm is that there's a whole group of these objects that are almost certainly from the same workshop. They include the same designs, the epigraphic style is the same, the subsidiary ornaments, these interlocking Ys, the same types of compartments are all the same. So the drawings might have been used within one single workshop. And it's hard to say definitively if the drawings, which you can see here, were made specifically for this bowl. But what they do tell us is that the maker of this bowl would have had access to these types of drawings, which previously were thought to only have been in the realm of what's called the Ketab Hane. It literally is house of books, but it's a workshop that primarily was concerned with the arts of the book. So I've lived with this object for pretty much my entire professional life. And over the years, I've come to understand the poem and what the poem tells us about how artists worked in late Timurid uh, Iran. So initially, I didn't understand that the, the line, I drew a maid a thousand designs for the sake of the bowl, was anything more than just poetic hyperbole. But once these drawings and albums, and as I mentioned, in Istanbul and Berlin, began to be published and studied, it became clear to me that they were used by a variety of artists and that they were key tools for artists, and it helped to create a fairly consistent style. It helps us to understand better why so much of Timur decorative arts appear to use the same types of designs over and over again. Not in a boring way, but there's a consistency to it. But the last iteration of my, my development in understanding um, this poem has to do with truly understanding or, or, or thinking more about the artistic personality. Now, as I, as I mentioned, when this was first published, it was assumed that that cartouche 
was a signature and so it was misread. In fact, it's not a signature and the artist who made this will remain anonymous, except his words have survived quoting about the, the bowl itself. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, this was a wonderful excuse to actually be able to handle this object, which I haven't done in many years. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for coming.